Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Emil Hkayim. I'm the Middle East uh, Fellow at the IISS. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining this, uh, this webinar. Uh, we have around 200 people uh, registered all the way from Singapore uh, to uh, the, the American West Coast. So I guess uh, this topic uh, uh, has not lost its relevance. Uh, and if anything, I suspect it to, it's, uh, it's a topic that will gain uh, momentum regardless of, uh, you know, what happens uh, in, in, you know, in the Gulf, in the U.S. in a few months and so on. Um, so much has changed in the U.S., in the Gulf and, uh, and globally that assuming that uh, things will remain in, in terms of the U.S. Uh, military presence in the Middle East uh, as they've been, um, could actually be complacency, uh, both analytically and, and policy-wise. Um, it certainly is a topic that uh, has been and, and will remain the, the subject of future ISS publications and meetings, uh, including at our annual uh, Manama Dialogue. This webinar is really about uh, assessing the wisdom, the merits, the benefits, uh, the costs, the future uh, of the vast U.S. military presence in the Gulf region. Uh, it brings together three U.S. perspectives on the matter. Um, at a later stage and after Eid al-Adha, uh, we'll put together a panel, uh, a webinar about the internalization of uh, Gulf security and bring together voices from the region. Um, by the way, and in advance, uh, Eid Mubarak for Eid al-Adha to all those who will celebrate a few days from now. Um, I'll briefly introduce the speakers, uh, but you have their bios, so it will be short. Uh, and a reminder, this event is on the record. Uh, we'll start with uh, Kirsten Fonterose, who's uh, currently at the, the Atlantic Council after a long career in the U.S. government, uh, most recently uh, the National Security Council uh, um, during the, the, the current administration. Uh, Daniel Benaim uh, is a fellow at the Century Foundation. Uh, he's previously served in uh, policy positions uh, in the Obama administration. Uh, and Becca Wasser um, is now at the Center for New American uh, Security, was previous, previously at RAND, and uh, was a dear colleague a few years uh, ago uh, at the ISS. Uh, so welcome to uh, 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 all of you. What I'll do is I'll ask a few questions uh, from each of the panelists to start. Um, and uh, I hope to you know, uh, start a discussion among them. Um, I'll then turn to the audience uh, to collect your questions uh, and, and convey them to, uh, to our panelists. You're probably all familiar with Zoom and more probably Zoomed out. Uh, but um, you know, uh, to make it easy, uh, type your, your answers uh, in the Q&A function uh, that you see uh, uh, right here at the bottom uh, of your uh, uh, Zoom window. So um, welcome, uh, Kirsten, uh, Daniel, and, and Becca. Uh, Kirsten, let me ask uh, uh, you the first question, um, you know, basic one, but I suspect we always have to go back to basics to, uh, you know, provide a, a, an honest assessment. Um, what is the U.S. posture designed to do uh, as it is currently bit? And is it fit for purpose? I mean, this wide, this military footprint that is quite uh, uh, significant and visible in the Gulf region. Thanks for the question, Emil, and thanks for everyone for joining us. I'm looking forward to hearing opinions from the audience as well, um, and obviously from hearing Dan and other speakers. Uh, the U.S. has sought to draw down forces in the Middle East for the past decade, and experiments with this, for example, 2011, have had unintended negative consequences, and each administration has had to moderate its vision for kind of a ticker tape parade with returning soldiers. But this president has been more consistently adamant that, about that goal of returning soldiers throughout his administration, and that has come in parallel with the U.S. military that seeks to pivot to Asia and pull manpower and materiel from the region. Unfortunately, the situation on the ground has not cooperated with these ideas of repatriating or repositioning the package of resources that the U.S. has committed to the Gulf over the past generation. And the Gulf has expected the U.S. to retain a 9-11 era presence and focus on the region. But the U.S. is asking what the return on investment has been of this posture. After 40 years of train and equip programming, the examples of Gulf partner military capabilities that can truly contribute to their own defense make it look like an investment that only a fool would make. And the, the U.S. has defined its objectives. They are laid out in the national security strategy and in the national defense strategy in unclassified, Googleable, black and white. But the U.S. has proven a little confused about its own objectives. For example, the U.S. national security strategy 
written in 2017, makes a statement on the Middle East. It commits the United States to retain the necessary American military presence in the region to protect the US and our allies from terrorist attacks and preserve a favorable regional balance of power. So it's a little vague. And a debate continues to rage within the US government about whether or not the Iran threat network constitutes terrorism. A lot of the authorities through which the US conducts CT operations are rooted in language that is specific to Al Qaeda, ISIS, and their affiliates. The designation under, of the IRGC under, under Trump has empowered all other arms of the US government to pursue the IRGC, you know, the tools of power across the interagency, but short of kinetics. So the rogue militia groups that were that trade strikes with in Iraq, for instance, they fall under special authorities we have for Iraq. Um, the U.S. continues to maintain the kind of footprint in the Gulf that facilitates what the U.S. sees as critical activities. And these include things like shaping operations. You may sometimes hear these are phase zero operations that maintain our relationships with partner militaries and, and the, with the intention of preventing the conditions for conflict. And then security cooperation, which includes the partner capacity building I've touched on, you know, questions of its investment, as well as military sales and funding and standard pre-planned deterrence operations, peacekeeping operations, stability operations, often done in conjunction with other members of the international community. Um, we also conduct special operation activities that are designed to have a specific effect on the ground. And then combat operations, should the need arise, that are intended to destroy an adversary's military infrastructure or materiel and push an adversary from territory they have taken in opposition to international law. I personally think that the argument that counterterrorism is no longer a threat worthy of U.S. attention is naive, and you do hear that from some corners. We're already seeing old and new extremist groups take advantage of the world distracted by COVID. Um, and that in itself, I think, is a reason to maintain the ability to conduct these critical functions in the Gulf. But in an era of renewed tensions with Iran, Saudi Arabia and the UAE specifically make it a little tough right now for the U.S. to choose to maintain its presence. They're negotiating their own terms with Iran, but without the U.S. in the conversation. So what they're doing is pushing for the U.S. to maintain troops on the ground in their backyards, but Iran has made it clear that they consider these troops legitimate military targets. What this means is that they're securing the safety of their own men and women while expecting the U.S. to station its men and women in the Gulf to be the cannon fodder. And the U.S. is having an increasingly difficult time seeing the logic in that, and even those who stand by the many other benefits of the relationship have a hard time arguing for why troops taking fire from Iran-backed groups is the way to secure that relationship. Um, one option is, that we've considered uh, recently is a mutual pact of non-aggression. And this is not just my idea. It's not a new idea. There are really smart folks at USIP who have been thinking about this. There are folks um, in other corners and in past administrations who have thought about this. In 95, something similar was tried between Saudi and Iran that kept the peace for quite some years. In essence, a mutual pact of non-aggression could kickstart the Macron plan, which only failed because there was no face-saving way for either the US or Iran to take a step. If the UAE or Saudi were to make their conversations with Iran about preventing bilateral conflict in the air or maritime space public, it would allow the US to then acknowledge that Iran has taken a step toward reducing the burden on the US to secure the Gulf which would give any U.S. administration a justification for reducing a token amount of U.S. presence there. And since this reduction of U.S. presence is Iran's top goal, this would then allow the regime in Tehran to take a step in reducing its aggression in the region, perhaps in Yemen or Iraq. What this, simply, what this allows for is a tit-for-tat de-escalation that pulls us back for where we are is kind of a, a proxy for confidence building measures and perhaps gets us to a place where we can, we can talk about um, some sort of negotiated uh, peace in the region. Thank you, uh, Kirsten. I, I mean, um, you, you have conveyed uh, US frustrations uh, uh, quite well. I mean, I suspect it, it's always difficult to uh, maintain, uh, you know, uh, those kind of uh, defense relationships when there are so many expectations and, and uh, misperceptions and, uh, uh, between, between partners. But I, I would like to trick you for a second and, and ask you, um, you talked about US frustrations. What about Gulf frustrations in, in the process? I mean, are they, how founded are they? Uh, you know, is, there, uh, is there something in the Washington debate about you know, the, the national security, the psychology of security of the Gulf states that needs to be uh, better understood or, 
or not. I mean, I'm just, it's an open question. Uh, put yourself in, in the shoes of a Saudi or an Emirati first again. Absolutely. They have very real frustrations that aren't, that aren't new. Um, and one large frustration they have is this kind of a destroyed dreams of a Trump administration that would, um, you know, rest restore their role in the region for them. Um, they were incredibly upset. They have great anger over the omission of Gulf parties from JCPOA negotiations in the last administration. During those negotiations, they felt Iran was given a blank check to continue criminal and terrorist activities in their countries and around the world in exchange for a Pyrrhic victory that only benefited the West. Um, but on the flip side, now they're seeing, you know, they, they have fear over the rhetoric out of the US that they feel provokes Iran on one hand and indicates the US is withdrawing on the other coming out of this administration. So they, they definitely feel like, um, like, they're, like they don't, like we're fickle. Um, I recall being in a meeting in the UAE uh, with a very, very senior leader who told us, we, we, we just don't know what you'll do next. We, I mean, he, his, his face was actually shaking, his jaw was, he said, you know, we want to be good partners. We're trying to be good partners, but we simply have to hedge our bets. We don't know where you're going next. Four years from now, we could be punished for doing what you ask us to do now. And eight years ago, you know, we spent eight years in the dark, in the closet, terrified of what was 100 kilometers from us because you all were cozying up to our greatest adversary when you were supposed to be our best friend. So the Gulf definitely has, uh, has a, a grievance in terms of US uh, mercurial nature that's just the product of our election system, not the product of any administration or personality um, that causes them some, some frustration. On, you know, on our side, we say, we understand that, but it's, it's part of being a democracy. And on what, one of the problems we have with the Gulf right now, we tell them, is that your untested leadership. You know, it was easier for us to have a Carter Doctrine for instance, with a cadre of very senior, wise, seasoned, experienced statesmen. But now, all, almost all at once, the Gulf is undergoing transition, which is beautiful on one level, but very disconcerting to a partner in terms of tying itself. Um, and so we need to see these new leaders tell, show us a little bit more about what they're made of. And in some cases, that's been um, very heartening. In some cases, it's been disheartening. And in some cases, the jury's still out. So while the Gulf has, a, has an, an understandable argument, uh, it's a really tough time for them to come asking for favors when we don't really know what their medal is yet. Thank you. Let me just uh, one last question um, in terms of grand strategy. I mean, are the growing relations between the Gulf states and, and Russia and China uh, a threat, a challenge to the relationship with the U.S.? I mean, you know, none of them are pitching themselves as, as replacement to the U.S., but to what extent do they make it difficult for Washington to justify either strategically or operationally uh, the presence in the region? They make it extremely difficult, and we've been very, very clear about this. We were demarching the UAE on its uh, part of its relationship with China back in 2018, and, uh, and we're consistently, you know, making it clear to them that they are the top rank in the U.S. hierarchy of threats due to their economic strength, their sophisticated strategies for undermining, um, you know, undermining the U.S. defense supply chain. They have robust propaganda and soft power machines that we find threatening. Um, add to that the nuclear program that in the Korean Peninsula. It's so much further along than Iran's that it, it could potentially throw a, pose a threat to the U.S. homeland, which we don't think Iran's does at this point. Um, you'll also note in the U.S. national security strategy, as compared to what I mentioned about our statement on the Middle East, our statement on, on the Indo-Chinese you know, Chinese peninsula is that to maintain a forward, I'm going to read to you directly because I have it right in front of me, maintain a forward military presence capable of deterring and if necessary, defeating any adversary. So, you know, not just sort of secure our commitments and uh, make us CT um, resilient, but deter and if necessary, defeat. The word defeat is not in the national security statement regarding the Middle East. So the Middle East should understand that this is going to be the way that the U.S. sees that part of the world. And that if you become their best friend, if you do your own pivot to Asia in a way that is friendly, then that's going to be a challenge to our relationship. Um, 
both China and Russia. They're expecting a request to, from the U.S. to disengage diplomatically on things like the arms embargo in Iran. Um, we want, we would want the Gulf to then use their leverage with China and Russia to prevent a veto of that. But one senior Emirati diplomat told me recently that the Gulf does not have enough leverage with either when it comes to core political and foreign policy issues to kind of move the needle on this. And I agree with him. So in that sense, what is the argument they have with the U.S. for maintaining that relationship? It starts to look like kids on a playground, you know, you're my best friend, you're, you're his best friend, um, because in, t today there doesn't appear to be any, um, any, any room for nuance or any gray space. It's an us or them. China has made it very clear with us um, that they're very comfortable with the U.S. securing the region at great expense to us and at loss of blood and treasure while they then secure trade relationships. And um, on one level, totally under, you know, understandable, wish we could be in the same position, frankly. But that also means that the U.S. is then paying the blood and treasure to make China richer, which is not part of our strategy, especially if you look at the legislation that was just approved on the Hill for um, competing with China. Now, you'll notice in that legislation, there is a bit of room about collaboration with China, which is great to see. Uh, but, but it makes it very, very clear that a strategy is going to be called for by the Hill for a U.S. interagency approach to addressing what we see as a, a Chinese threat, as I mentioned, across these sectors, like the economy, like um, soft power, like uh, weapon sales. Um, you know, one of the reasons we just announced that the U.S. will no longer station our, our dependence in the Gulf is because we are having to reallocate resources and manpower to other parts of the world. And we're trying to send the Gulf a, relation, a, a, a message. We're not going to invest in you that strongly. We're not going to send families out for years if you are in effect going to become best friends with our greatest adversary. That's not in our interest. So it is within the Gulf's power to help secure the U.S. commitment to the region by decreasing their growing strategic relationship with China and with Russia. This is not a done deal. I mean, they are, they are a player in that game. It's not simply the U.S. making a decision behind closed doors. We're directly reacting to what we see as them buying into the influence of our greatest adversary. It affects things like interoperability. You know, we can't risk um, selling cutting edge technologies or sharing cutting edge uh, tactics and techniques or even intelligence at a certain level with a region that has China literally inside their bases. You know, or, or who is purchasing platforms that we know China builds back doors into so that if they do plug them into a network that, say, was interoperable with the U.S. or NATO, China would pull all that data back. We just, those are just naive risks. So, um, so, yes, their relationship and that growing influence is definitely a problem for us. Not everywhere. You know, buy toys, buy tech, uh, certain kinds of, of technological innovations. That's great. We're, we're not saying we want to bring China to its knees. We're saying please don't make it impossible for us to be a strategic partner with you and to increase your own capacity and capability to secure yourselves and to operate interoperably with us by uh, instead pulling in technologies and advisors um, and creating access for our greatest strategic adversary to see how we do things. Um, we don't want you to be the leak. Thank you. Um, well, it's it started. It's uh, say I, I'm going to turn to uh, to to Daniel, and I, I saw him uh, shake, uh, you know, shaking his head in, in approval on, on a number of comments you you made. So uh, let me jump straight and and ask you, um, regardless of uh, you know what happens in in November and in you know January as well, um, are, are are we headed towards a reassessment of the U.S. presence in the region? Um, you know, from what I hear from, from Kirsten, there are, you know, strategic, political, and operational challenges to keeping things the way they are. Uh, but there are, you know, from your perspective, and you just uh, wrote a report for the Century Foundation looking at, a bit at the fundamentals of, of that, that partnership, do you think that we're heading, heading inevitably towards a reassessment? Well, I think that the public, in terms of posture, the public debate sometimes jumps straight to the question of are troops in or out, uh, one word answers only, you know, and uh, that kind of captures decades of anxiety on the Gulf side and also the exhaustion of the American public. But to me, maybe the more important question is not in or out uh, in terms of fine calibrations of posture, but how? 
uh, how do you actually, given these competing priorities, given uh, the kind of crowded margins of great power competition in the region, how do you actually set the conditions to gradually but deliberately lighten the military footprint as two U.S. administrations have now said they would do, as Kirsten pointed out, without actually leaving greater instability behind while maintaining the deterrence and influence uh, for U.S. interests that do remain. Uh, uh, now, speaking only for myself, I think if you do end up with a different administration, uh, I suspect you're likely to see first and foremost a reassessment of policy, uh, both a reassessment of maximum pressure on Iran in favor of an approach that widens the opening for diplomacy alongside deterrence and strategic competition, and also of, of what I call uh, maximum latitude for Saudi Arabia, which is kind of a, a bookend to maximum pressure uh, in favor of maybe more conditional approach that asserts U.S. leverage to influence Saudi behavior toward different priorities in some of the ways actually that Kirsten was describing, uh, including toward a focus on lowering regional te uh, tensions and de-escalation. I think we're definitely headed uh, in these discussions, we talk about military posture and sometimes leave out civilian posture and civilian engagement. I think we're headed toward, uh, if, if we should see a change, uh, toward a reassertion of the importance and primacy of that kind of civilian diplomatic engagement. Uh, and, and, and toward finding a way, hopefully, to measure commitment in terms of more than the number of carrier groups. Uh, and I think in a variety of ways, you'd see efforts to strengthen the State Department and put forward diplomacy as a tool of foreign policy. Now, military posture shouldn't be set in stone, uh, and it hasn't been, frankly. Uh, we've seen numbers rise by tens and tens of thousands uh, amid tensions with Iran, despite the national defense strategy, uh, and with lots of fanfare. And even then, I'm not sure that you could directly correlate the precise U.S. posture with uh, enhanced U.S. credibility because uh, posture and policy uh, really need to go hand in hand here. So if we, over time, can address the tensions that required those changes in posture, the force uh, threats, the, the you know, uh, tensions, d defensive uh, needs inside of Gulf countries. If we're able to address those using diplomacy instead, uh, we may not need quite so many troops, just as we didn't in 2016 while leading a 70-member anti-ISIS coalition. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, and, and it's important to realize that quite apart from some of the sort of most sensitive parts of this, there are a lot of other changes that are underway. You know, America's war in Afghanistan appears to be winding down. That uh, casts a long logistical shadow through the entire Middle East, that tale of that war. Uh, it, it may be possible, thanks to technology, to migrate some operational functions out of Iranian range and back onto U.S. soil, uh, which should be worth considering. And, you know, frankly, none of this is happening in a vacuum. Uh, it come late January, uh, a new president's inbox will be a nightmare of overlapping domestic crises, uh, a relationship with China that's turned increasingly hostile omnidirectionally, uh, uh, plans for renewed diplomacy with Iran, reassuring allies in Europe uh, and Asia, and recasting those relationships, all of which, to, to me personally, I think augurs against a dramatic, immediate uh, reshaping of U.S. military posture in favor of more graduate, deliberate shifts that uh, reflect a changing conditions on the ground and in service of uh, change policy. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you, you said the question is, is how. So, you know, we, you know, we often, when we talk to, to American interlocutors, we want to know, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? I mean, you know, say, uh, let me reverse that and say, um, okay, if the U.S. Uh, needs to rethink or reassess parts of its uh, 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 presence in the region, what does it expect uh, its uh, traditional Gulf partners to do? I mean, from, you know, the high strategy side to the more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mundane uh, 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 change in, in, in attitude. Uh, certainly, this is a relationship that is actually quite fraught. Uh, you know, I, there's a long list. Uh, it starts mm -hmm. with, uh, I don't know, A, but, uh, you know, Yemen would be the last one and Khajuji would be in the middle and, uh, and the JCPOA and, and so on. I mean, on, on, on both sides, there's, there's a lot of, uh, as Kirsten said, uh, there's, a, there, there's a lot of, of emotion. Um, what would a, a U.S. administration ask or want the Gulf states uh, to do to, in a way, preserve that relationship, even as the U.S. rethinks, uh, you know, how it's deployed on the ground? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question. I mean, and I think that, uh, let me give you a sense of what that debate looks like uh, from within democratic policymakers, uh, where, where I have better acuity into this picture. And I think most, most of them agree, basically, in terms of 
a change in direction uh, and, and I think a critique of the current approach. They want to test diplomacy with Iran. They want to end what remains of U.S. support in Yemen. They have a sense that Trump's latitude for Saudi Arabia has not always led to policies that were pursued that advance U.S. interests and values, and that the U.S. is not, maybe not as, as beholden and can afford to test its leverage and assert those values a little bit more. I think that's the kind of commonality that, that comes with a sense of, of pairing reassurance and responsibility, maybe, in terms of uh, the responsibility to hew uh, closer or offer more fidelity to the concerns and values of the United States uh, in making some of the decisions that it's made. And I won't go through the long litany. But the, the Democratic policymakers who have those views don't necessarily agree on the destination uh, for that vector shift. Uh, and you see really, I saw two major camps, uh, resetters and rethinkers, who I think maybe want different things to your question. Resetters want to apply a kind of tough love paradigm in service of a reformed U.S.-Saudi strategic partnership under different terms, less unconditional toward different goals. And rethinkers are calling for a more dramatic downshift, questioning, uh, as Kirsten described in some cases, the reliability of Saudi Arabia as a partner and tend to, all of which tends to fit into a critique of an overly militarized policy. I think both of those strands will probably influence policy. Personally, I favor reform over rupture. And I think we need, as I said, to pair reassurance with responsibility, with apologies for alliteration. I th think we need to uh, get away from the idea that the only options are uh, ending the relationship altogether or uh, maximum latitude for any number of uh, moves that I think were destabilizing and ultimately damaging to the constituency that Saudi Arabia would want to have inside the United States. And we're going to have to explore some of that uncomfortable space in between to see whether Saudi Arabia would take greater account of U.S. interests and values in its conduct and offer a degree of reassurance in return, uh, leaving open a more difficult path if we don't see that happen. Now, I think that while it's not what it once was, I do think that there's actually an enduring strategic rationale for a U.S.-Saudi uh, and U.S. Gulf partnership in counterterrorism and securing oil supplies to world markets and maintaining, you know, deep educational and commercial ties that really do matter and I think are consistently underrated uh, in navigating regional challenges together, for example, uh, bringing Iraq back into the Arab fold. Uh, I also think that there's a long-term strategic value in ensuring that neither Iran nor China can gain coercive control over the oil supplies that go to Europe, to Asia, and to India, so that even though we're dealing with the moral hazard that, that Kirsten described, I think there is probably also a bound there in terms of where we would want to see things go. But sustaining that partnership depends on changing Saudi behavior so as not to face the kinds of destabilizing and damaging incidents that, you know, the litany that, that uh, Emil was alluding to, which if those are harbingers of more disruptive, destabilizing moves ahead, I think you'll see a lot more rethinkers and a lot fewer resetters. Uh, so Saudi choices will matter a lot and Gulf choices will matter a lot. Are they going to take steps that build confidence uh, with an administration that would have different priorities, I think, and some key areas, or are they going to undermine that confidence? Uh, and that's why I guess I think personally it's worth in thinking about policy, leaving time and space to see how Gulf countries intend to change their and modify their approach and working with a different U.S. administration that has maybe different priorities and standards for what it hopes to see from them in the region. Uh, just a, you know, a specific question because it, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, uh, radioactive one in, in, in the Gulf. Oh, good. Um, should... Uh, should the, um, should the U.S. presence be directly linked, or should it should it be reduced to, in a way, accommodate or facilitate a nuclear deal with Iran? I mean, you know, if you listen to to the Iranians, they basically say, look, the the, the fundamental problem in the Middle East is the presence of U.S. troops in 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 the region. If the U.S. troops leave, then you know things are fine. I mean, in a way, I'm. I'm you know, I'm simplifying the argument. Uh, apologies for uh, it's just a question of time. But, you know, is that really a, an argument that would gain traction in Washington, where you, you link the, the nuclear deal to a significantly reduced or changed U.S. presence or commitment to the region? You know, I, I guess I don't see it that way. That, that the, I don't share that view that, that the U.S. footprint is the main obstacle to an organic regional architecture, Neil, as we were talking about earlier. I think there are too many layers of competition and interference unfolding simultaneously. I don't think that U.S. withdrawal is the missing ingredient. You have regional powers that are interfering in weaker states that are afraid that their rivals will destabilize them at home. You have Russia and increasingly China engaged. You have a sort of multiplying security dilemmas uh, in, across the region. And, and to me, the question is whether U.S. diplomacy can help lower those threat perceptions 
or channel that competition away from proxy war. And I would think that the greater risk is in creating vacuums uh, in the near term and the long term that would be quite destabilizing. It is not realistic or desirable in my mind to achieve a US Iran regional understanding over the heads of our Gulf partners. Uh, a nuclear deal that affects international security is one thing. Regional issues need a regional dialogue. Uh, and I don't think that America should have that conversation without the Gulf. And I think that the Gulf will have to have that conversation in a way that factors in American interests too, which is why I've called for, I think just, uh, for uh, internationally supported regional dialogue to be in loose parallel with the, the nuclear deal. Uh, I think there's a much better way to bring partners to the table backed by America and the international community to try to reach their own understandings, to put bounds on mutually damaging strategic cooperation, uh, a competition, not to end it. And I think if we could achieve a GCC, Iran, or a Saudi-Iran non-aggression pact, that really would be a win-win-win in the sense that both sides would face a lower threat perception and our burden would be lightened as well. I think that's, that's, it's quite difficult to do, but I think for a lot of reasons, it may be less impossible than it's been in the past and worth trying. Not necessarily worth staking uh, progress on the nuclear issue, which is a vital national interest to achieve and not necessarily uh, risking America's force posture in the Middle East to achieve. But I think from the nuclear deal, you could have a kind of dotted line approach where a regional, you, you have com for com at the outset alongside nuclear talks, which is a regional component. And over time, you, uh, you create this parallel track and the full depth and extent uh, of uh, opening or re uh, sanctions relief or implementation to Iran, it depends on the regional file. I think if you see Iran making progress on the nuclear file and still at the brink of war on the regional file, it'll be hard to move uh, past a certain point. And I think trying to align these different areas of progress is going to be devilishly difficult because you don't want to take hostage the, uh, the nuclear deal or the force posture to address them, but it's worth thinking creatively about how they might eventually be connected. Thank you. Um... Let me turn to Becca. Uh, Becca has many things. Uh, my, you know, former colleague, co-author, uh, but it's, I also turn to her Twitter account every time, uh, you know, there's a U.S. military deployment in the region and everyone is panicking. Oh, there's an aircraft carrier. Or, oh, there's no aircraft carrier uh, or, you know, missile defense uh, thing. I, I don't understand the stuff uh, Becca does, uh, but, you know, she's, she, I, I turn to her for, for a dose of, of sobriety. Um, so let me ask you the first question, uh, Becca. I mean, given we, we heard why the US is in the region. Um, but is the presence right sized? Is, is this large footprint necessary the way it is? Can, could the US conduct those missions uh, with a lighter footprint? Uh, are some of these missions uh, 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 doable without a, a, a footprint from the region? You know, we can all, almost, we can also, of course, question uh, the merits of these, these missions, but that's, that's a different uh, discussion. And just, uh, so please go ahead, Becca. Yeah, so at present, at present, US presence in the Gulf is not right-sized. And it was not right-sized prior to the massive, um, you know, plus up of forces that we saw um, from May to January of this past year. And you know, some of this is really about what is almost a historic misalignment of interest to strategic objectives to resources. So here, while yes, maybe we are stating what our interests are more clearly in some documents rather than others, that's not always what the United States does in practice, how it actually gets implemented. And I think with this most recent administration, there's been this muddling of what some of these objectives are with the national defense strategy. It's been very clear that you know, China and Russia are the top two priorities, um, but you've seen sort of a reneging on that in implementation. So for example, you have uh, the United States in October of 2019 withdrew four Patriot batteries from the Middle East in order to free them up to go to uh, Europe and Asia to better deter Russia and China. Those four Patriot batteries are now back in the Middle East. So you have sort of this weird tension between what stated interests and objectives are, but how they've actually been implemented. And when you sort of look at that in a much broader context of this misalignment of interests to resources, you realize that 
forces and force presidents, as well as basic architecture in the region, it's not right-sized uh, because there's still this tension and there are still critical gaps. So I will say that even though forces aren't right-sized, often when we talk about trying to do that, there's this perception that it's going to be this massive troop withdrawal or there's going to be closure of major bases like al Al-Dafra. And chances are that's not how it's going to happen. And that's most likely not what is going to happen. So some of this is more of an incremental change that will occur over time. And so Daniel had started by talking a little bit about how you set the conditions for a change in US posture identifying what those priorities are and trying to get those conditions to actually um, occur, that's going to take some time. So if you'll indulge me just a little bit longer, I think right now the debate over what U.S. force presence in the Gulf looks like, everyone talks about, you know, we need to enhance diplomacy in order to withdraw forces. I don't disagree. I think that there's been a tool in the United States toolkit that has gone underutilized and for the most part that is diplomacy and actively using our diplomatic tools will um, potentially give us more space and more room to look at what our military options are and what our footprint is. However, that focus and that debate always negates what some of the operational imperatives are for the United States to be in the Middle East more broadly and specifically in the Gulf, which makes up the basis of our regional security architecture. So I think we need to talk a little bit about how do you right size forces? So you have this parallel effort going on to try and set the conditions that will enable the US to potentially do less or to use other tools in its toolkit. What do you do with the US forces that are there and how is it that you do how is it that you think about what might actually occur? So here, I think we've neglected a, a really strong reassessment or analysis of what our operational objectives are in support of our strategic interests, as well as thinking, how is it that we best achieve those? So identifying our objectives and priorities, better mapping our resources to them, and thinking about the full range of potential contingencies that could emerge that would threaten our interests would allow us to do a better assessment of what our operational needs are. And you can do these for a variety of different ways, war gaming being one of them. And so after doing this parallel effort, you'll have a better sense of where there need to be no kidding US forces in order to achieve objectives, which may include the support and protection of US partners and allies in the region. And thinking a little bit more about this and what it would look like, as I said, it's not going to be these massive base closures, but I think you're going to have um, what I'm going to refer to as base consolidation. So you, there's actually a much larger footprint in the Gulf in terms of basing as well as outposts than what people realize. Um, and so there are some of these smaller, um, it, you know, small bases, whether this is a logistics depot, an arms depot, um, you know, a shared naval base, or, you know, a newer uh, outpost that uh, has less permanent um, structures on it. You know, those are the types of places where you can actually have a more active rethink about where U.S. forces go and uh, think about transitioning those uh, bases and structures over to um, host nation, or in some cases, back to the host nation. You, you also can focus on negotiating greater overflight and access rights. So in case of contingencies, the United States could have access and ability to operate out of those bases, should that be the place that they need to for whatever its objectives are. Additionally, you can think about better mapping capabilities to location. So if you go through the full range of potential contingencies that emerge, it'll help you better analyze where it is that you need some of these high demand, low density assets like air, air and missile defenses, or where is it that you really need to be forward stationing some of your aircraft so that they can have more time on station and not have to refuel as much 
if you think that you are going to be in XYZ location in a future contingency. So you can have a better mapping that way. And lastly, you can also think about ways in which you can better utilize your forces to achieve a full range of what your objectives are. You know, right now, if we're looking at the national defense strategy, there's a lot more that US forces that are already in the Middle East can be doing to uh, better compete with China and Russia, um, to be demonstrating operational unpredictability, to uh, be deterring revisionist actors like Iran, um, or to be doing things like strengthening alliances and partners. And in some ways, this is just reframing some of the activities that they're already doing, but putting them more within this context of US interests and priorities, because right now it's entirely muddled and it makes it quite difficult to have this conversation about what a right size force genuinely looks like. I, I, I wanted to ask you something. Um, I have the sense, and I may be wrong, but that actually uh, the military to military relations between the US and its Gulf partners um, in a way is the default mode. It's the comfort, the comfortable mode. It's that when the political relationship is, is challenged, when there is uh, too much uh, gas in the water, et cetera, it's easier to ask uh, you know, a, a powerful, strong looking four star general uh, coming down from his airplane in you know, some of this Gulf capital to you know, maintain the relationship going. That actually, you know, the, 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 the Gulf states are security obsessed. Uh, they, are, they see the kit. Uh, they, they see the CENTCOM commander as way more powerful than his State Department counterpart, the Assistant Secretary. Uh, you know, the, the way the media coverage uh, of their respective visits uh, is uh, in the region uh, tells you something. Um, is it is it the case that defense relations, uh, those, this mill-mill uh, uh, relationship can trump uh, uh, or moderate uh, uh, the, the, this U.S. desire for readjustment that I heard from uh, Daniel and, and Kirsten? Is that like, is there a specific constituency in the military or elsewhere that, you know, is really uh, uh, vested in uh, doing the things the way they have, they are being done right now? Yeah, so I think your question is definitely a two-parter. And I'll start with the second part first, which is talking a little bit about the constituencies. I would say that a lot of the military personnel who have spent significant time doing security cooperation activities with a number of Gulf partners, but particularly the United Arab Emirates, tend to be very gung-ho for keeping things status quo, if not doing more. And some of this um, really speaks to uh, the emphasis that regional partners have put on the military relationship. As you noted, some of it is a little bit about having access, but a lot of it is also um, sort of a two-level game and thinking about ways in which not only do the Gulf states want to be hedging with extra regional partners, they also want to be hedging with various partners within the US government so that when the White House comes down uh, with perhaps an edict that they don't like, they can then go to, as you noted, the CENTCOM commander and have that frank and open conversation. But this is also a little bit about how security cooperation truly works because the mill to mill relationship, what it's really about is security cooperation. These are the building partner capacity activities that Kirsten mentioned, armed sales, education and training, uh, bilateral and multilateral exercises, you name it. Um, what that really is about, security cooperation takes time to bear fruit. It is a long-term endeavor. And for a number of the Gulf states and the Gulf state leaders, even though there is this generational change that is um, currently taking place in a number of these countries, you know, having that uh, continuation of, um, of leaders or at least you know, key people to go to has been really important because that personal relationship is so important in a number of Gulf capitals. And so in that way, it can be, using the mill to mill relationship can almost be a little bit of reassurance, but it's not going to be the panacea because ultimately what this comes down to, and I think you know, all of us on the panel and you and me all have sort of alluded to this at uh, various points, it comes down to the perception that is being held in Gulf capitals about what 
a U.S. drawdown, even if minor, will look like. And, you know, it will most likely be perceived as regional, as American retrenchment from the region. And so in that regard, that will never be something that can be overcome because it's not the U.S. that is creating that perception necessarily. That is being held by individuals. So you kind of have a chicken or the egg problem here um, that no matter what you do, no matter how much reassurance you provide in whatever form, whether that is an arms sale, whether that is a key leader engagement, whether that is even, frankly, the forward stationing of troops as a tripwire, it still is not going to necessarily be enough to overcome these perceptions because that is what the United States has done and it hasn't been enough to get over, frankly, fears that were really rampant in 2011, if not earlier, even 2008. Well, thank you very much. Uh, all this is very uh, rich. Um, I'm, I'm just going to turn to, uh, to the audience for, for questions. A reminder, um, if you have a question, please type it directly in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom. Um, so I mean, first, uh, a, a question to, to Daniel, I think, uh, first and foremost. Uh, should, should the US um, actually invite the GCC to be part of a negotiation of, any, of a deal with Iran? I mean, you know, including the nuclear deal. Or is it as you suggested uh, that these things need to go in, in, in parallel? Um, you know, for a lot of us, um, you know, we see what happened between 2012, 2013 in terms of the nuclear diplomacy and, and how actually, uh, even though, I mean, at least in my part, I think the nuclear deal was a good thing and it was a mistake to leave, uh, to leave it, the diplomacy around it uh, was very problematic. Uh, and, and it's not, the, I, I would say that the Gulf opposition to the deal had less to do with the terms of the deal with what they thought the deal was leading to. So the question is, is a way to preempt this to bring in the Gulf states more into the discussion or, or not? I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not making an assumption one way or another on, on that one. Uh, so would you have um, something to? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, look, I think that uh, achieving the first nuclear agreement from 40 years of, of uh, lack of dialogue on these issues was an incredibly uh, difficult thing and required a degree of secrecy at the outset. Uh, that I think was probably a one-time occurrence would be my guess, personally. And I think that going forward, uh, as was the case toward the end of nuclear negotiations after a sort of secret beginning, uh, you would want to see uh, the, the direct parties to the negotiation, the P5 plus one uh, and Iran, which is already quite a large number of diverse stakeholders, uh, working together uh, to consult as closely as possible with a lot of different actors whose uh, future security and stability are uh, are implicated in the deal. I don't know that you need to change the shape of the nuclear table to do that, but I think you probably have to, to update the environs to uh, try uh, better this time to win uh, Gulf buy-in. And, and I guess I'm hopeful on the other side. I'm optimistic about your description that the problem was the process and not the substance, because that would suggest that uh, with a modified process, there might be greater receptivity to the substance of a nuclear accommodation. And I, and I do think that, uh, and Kirsten alluded to this a little bit, the idea of a kind of U.S. deus ex machina that is going to remove uh, the Iranian threat from countries, uh, you know, a few dozen miles away, uh, in some cases, is not uh, realistic. It wasn't going to happen under Bush and Cheney or Trump, Pompeo and Bolton. And I think there's an increasing recognition that as the U.S. Pro approached the brink of war uh, with Iran and uh, pursued some of the kinds of muscular policies that Gulf countries have asked for over many years, there was a kind of a dog that caught the car problem of, uh, you know, suddenly we're at the verge of war and we don't feel safe. So I do think that the, the diplomatic terrain looks a little bit different. And that gives me cause for tempered optimism that, you uh, there might be a, a, a whole different valence around a U.S. approach to Iran. And I certainly think that uh, given that, that a new democratic administration might pursue such an approach, it might be an area where uh, Gulf states could inspire confidence in their response and, and uh, show a different and uh, more constructive approach. 
Yeah, I mean, very, very smart people disagree with me on this, but I do think the process <laughs> was really bungled on, on that one. And in, in a way, there is a, it was in, an unnecessary uh, escalation uh, between, between the previous administration and, and the Gulf states on a number of issues. I wouldn't conflate the Gulf uh, position on the JCPOA with Israel's position, for instance. I think the, the starting point were, were very different uh, in, in this matter. Apologies to everyone for jumping in. Uh, I can't be the chair. <laughs> hey. uh, Kirsten, uh, you know, a, a question on this. I mean, you, you made a very strong point about uh, uh, the relationship between uh, uh, the Gulf states and, and Russia and, and especially uh, China. Uh, do you think that um, the U.S. will impose pressure, uh, m even more pressure, regardless of which administration uh, comes into the White House in January on this issue in terms of technology, in terms of, of arm, arms procurement, etc.? I mean, you know, this could well be a, I mean, I would suspect that uh, both Republicans and Democrats across the spectrum actually agree on this. It's watching the debate from far. Uh, you know, China and, and Russia have almost become, you know, uh, issues of wide consensus uh, in, in, in D.C. Not, not total, but, uh, you know, still, um, you know, do you see that? Uh, and is it a, a case where you can have an ultimatum, you know, on, on certain uh, uh, technologies? Since I sit in London right now and we saw the discussion over Huawei and, and how insistent the U.S. was with the U.K. government. Uh, could that, could something like that take place with the Gulf states? I think in a short answer, yes, on both. So yes, you're going to see more pressure. And I don't think I'm just making an educated guess by saying it could be from either administration that comes next. I mean, because of the assessment we saw recently out of the, the intelligence community in the US, which pretty much everyone has faith in and takes seriously, um, tells us that you know China is a, a, a true threat to many of the US sectors. And because of the legislation we just saw introduced from a bipartisan list of sponsors on the Hill, we're definitely going to see more pressure um, partners to disengage in certain sectors from China. On technology, yes, I think it would be smart to issue ultimatums, not on the relationship with China, um, but on, as you mentioned, specific technologies. Let's make it very clear. When we're not clear, we, we don't make it fair for our partners. You know, they need to know where our red lines are, and that's been trouble for the U.S. for, for a long time. So is it, is it a specific part? Is it a specific component? Is it a specific company? Um, something designed by a specific engineer. Whatever it is, let's make it very clear, this is a no-go for us and what that means. If you do purchase this, we will withdraw this. And whether that's sort of a, a punitive measure, carrot and stick kind of thing, or whether it's simply, um, we will be forced to withdraw this technology from what we're planning to share with you, or we'll be forced to pull our people out of this particular joint, you know, joint operation cell in which you are a part because of now, you know, now we believe there's a, there's a threat due to the interoperability you now have with China. Whatever we think the, the issue is, we need to be super, super clear about it so that they can make decisions. And then if they make decisions that, that we think are against our interests, we're justified in that. And it doesn't look like we are mercurial or like we are being uh, fickle. You know, we've been very clear about how we perceive the threat, why we perceive the threat. We're backing it up with assessments from our IC. We're pointing to legislation by our Congress. And, um, and, and allowing them to make their own decisions. Thank you. Um, Becca, um, you know, there's a couple of questions about uh, the impact of, of Gulf disunity. Uh, you know, different assessment of, uh, of Iran, uh, you know, real tensions between, uh, you know, Saudi, the UAE on one hand, uh, Bahrain as well, and, and Qatar on the other. Uh, you know, a couple of uh, countries uh, trying to, you know, stay in the middle and, and not to take too many, uh, too many hits. To what extent is Gulf disunity a, an impediment to one Gulf policy, uh, to U.S. policy in the Gulf? But second, to you know, U.S. wishes for a different posture. I mean, is this a, the, a kind of uh, um, you know, are inter-Gulf squabbles uh, in a way affecting uh, what the U.S. can do and at at, at what cost? That's Absolutely. So, you know, the first point that I'll make is one that, you know, your question got to, but I think perhaps maybe we haven't said uh, on this panel quite as starkly as we should, which is each Gulf state has different interests and objectives. The GCC is in some ways a paper tiger. Um, it exists 
more so in theory than in actuality. So the Gulf states are not a monolithic block. And I think in DC, we tend to sometimes say the Gulf states lump them all together. But from my vantage and where I sit, you know, just looking at each of the Gulf states, you know, each one has a very different set of capabilities as well as uh, their ability to carry out military operations. So when you look at their interests and objectives being different, as well as their different skill sets, these are just six different countries. Just wanted to throw that one out there. Um, additionally, when it comes down to how has disunity among these different nations impacted U.S. policy, as well as operations, as well as any attempt to change U.S. posture. So I'll start with um, U.S. operations. For the most part, there has only been a minor impact on U.S. operations in the region brought on by the Gulf Rift. The place where this has been the most relevant has been trying to bring um, forces from one base, usually forces that are stationed at al -Udaid, uh, to other countries, um, in part because not all of the countries in the Gulf allow, um, allow U.S. service members to uh, travel on their uh, orders rather than their passports. So, for instance, if someone doesn't have, um, you know, the right orders or passports, it gets kind of difficult for exercises. So it has required a rethink of some of who's doing the training and who's doing the exercises. For the most part, that's a fairly minor uh, inconvenience that the U.S. has managed to find uh, workarounds to. There has, however, been significant impact on U.S. policy or inability to create any type of meaningful change in the Gulf in a variety of different areas. And so for what I've been looking at the most is this has had a major impact on interoperability. Interoperability among the Gulf states and with the United States has been a stated goal of almost every U.S. administration um, since, you know, the U.S. Gulf relations started to be established. Um, there has always been this idea that the U.S. could operate with and alongside its Gulf partners, and this became really an imperative after the Gulf War, where uh, a number of the Gulf states that participated were not able to leverage their capabilities to the extent to which the United States wanted for proper burden sharing. So today, there was already a disincentive uh, within the Gulf states to want to exercise together. Um, oftentimes, even in multilateral exercises with the United States, you almost got more of that hub and spoke system where you had each of the, um, each of the countries exercising with the United States, but not necessarily with each other. The Gulf Rift has exacerbated that to the extreme. So genuine interoperability is something that has become truly hard to achieve, as well as complementarity. So ways in which some of these small states could maximize some of their capabilities and work better to enhance their own security with some of their partners. And this is even on sides of states that are aligned within the Gulf Rift. So for example, UAE, Saudi, and Bahrain could be doing more exercising and working together to strengthen their own security, but we're not even seeing some of that occurring right now. So overall, there has been a major impact on US military policy, and the fact that these states are not interoperable means that there's still this reinforcement of need for US presence and the need for the US to support these states to ensure their security. Well, certainly, I mean, I'm just curious, uh, both uh, Kirsten and, and Becca, um, how would you rate uh, the progress of uh, security cooperation uh, with, with the Gulf states? I mean, from where I stand as a, as a novice in the, in the field, um, I don't see much uh, uh, happening and certainly see intentions and uh, strategic dialogues and, and so on and, and big announcements. But if you look at at least three, four areas, uh, maritime security, uh, cyber security, missile defense, uh, you know, I can go, uh, go through that. Um, it's difficult to, you know, just put a, 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 a you know, to rate uh, how well these are, are going because you feel that there's actually not much going. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, motion without, without movement. Is it unfair? I, I'm willing to, to take it, uh, uh, Kirsten, if you 
Can Tizu first? I think with, you know, the exception of CT in the UAE, you're, you're dead on. Um, we, we, we have a really hard time looking for proof of the, the, you know, several four plus decades we've spent training and equipping and, and trying to exercise with the Gulf. Uh, wonderful partners full of intent, but we haven't seen a lot on the back end in terms of progress. And to Becca's point, a lot of it is that they do not enjoy being interoperable with each other and they want solely bilateral relations with the U.S. But if they should have picked up anything over these years, it's that the U.S. likes to operate with a coalition. Uh, and so, you know, the, the more interoperable they are with each other, the stronger and more valuable partner they are as a block to the U.S. We've also seen very definitive signs of them um, uh, kind of getting in the way of that. For, for one thing, um, the U.S. tried to start and is still working on a Middle East strategic alliance. And we've seen predominantly Saudi Arabia and the UAE slow rolling and narrowing the intent of that. Uh, that would have committed the U.S. across administrations. And one of the whole points of it was to increase interoperability, exercise together, train together, um, you know, uh, access to, to cutting edge technologies before other people, um, spe specific exercises just for that block with other countries invited per the desire of the original Gulf states plus Egypt and Jordan. So it was really a, a classic example of cutting off one's nose to spite one's face. The Gulf says it wants the U.S. to prove it intends to stay and be more committed, but then they've hampered the largest and most serious effort the U.S. government has made in a decade to increase their interoperability with us and with each other. They may have lost their chance to lock the U.S. into this relationship. They can't expect the same offer from a new administration. Um, and, uh, and this will definitely impact both our ability to operate with them in the future for their own security and our willingness to come to their aid if we don't feel like they've made a concerted effort themselves. I'll just, oh, I'll just jump in if I may. So I think there, in addition to everything that Kirsten said, 110% spot on, fully in agreement. Um, I do think that there's also been this misalignment of what, what the areas they should be emphasizing in terms of learning skills and in terms of capabilities. So maritime security has been woefully ignored for years, despite almost all of these countries being littoral states despite many of them having these long storied histories of being uh, you know, commercial maritime powers at the very least. So you know, that's one area that I think we've seen things you know, really been, uh, you know, have heated up in the past with Iran and a place where they could put more resources and capabilities to, and they just choose not to, perhaps maybe in part because it's not as sexy as you know, aircraft, who knows. Um, but I will say there has been some slight improvement in terms of uh, basic skill sets in certain countries in key areas. And a lot of this has been in the air. So, you know, still not necessarily what I would say as being proficient, but enough um, that they're able to carry out, in some cases, independent operations. And so for me, I would say the one difference in what we've seen is taking, in taking these capabilities and these skill sets that largely number of these states, but particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE with an emphasis on the latter, have learned from the United States and taking them and using them independently. And that's what we want with building partner capacity. But the issue with that is when you create an independent capability to quote a US, former US official, you create an independent capability that these states can choose to use however they want. And they will often use them in ways that run counter to US interests. And for the large part, this is what we've seen with Yemen. And it's really created um, sort of this, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy or what we usually call a self-licking ice cream cone uh, in DOD speak. Um, and it's created a need for more US forces in the region because of some of the instability that has emerged in Yemen in terms of the requests that the US is getting from a number of the Gulf states, but particularly Saudi Arabia to assist them with missile defense and border defense, as well as requests for things like aerial refueling, which the US no longer does for Yemen, but at one point had a sizable impact on taxing some of the region-wide responsibilities that the US had in the air. So just sort of putting that in a greater context that's probably the biggest difference that we've seen in the past few years and is something that's worth clocking because that's a trend that is unlikely to change anytime soon. Daniel, you wanted to jump in? I did. Well, I mean, first to say that I find myself in unexpectedly violent agreement with my colleagues uh, about uh, what they've described in terms of the 
security cooperation, but second to add that we'd be remiss uh, if we didn't mention one more actor in this space, which is the United States Congress. Uh, it's a remarkable fact that, that uh, Donald Trump has used the majority of his vetoes as president on legislation pertaining to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I do think you can expect an assertive US Congress uh, to continue to work to shape uh, security cooperation, arms sales, and other issues, uh, and, and uh, to be a factor in this discussion, and a factor probably that makes it a bit harder to cabin off the military uh, discussions and prerogatives from the larger atmospherics of the relationship and some of the other concerns. So I, I feel like if we didn't say the words United States Congress uh, in this discussion, we wouldn't have fully covered the ground we needed to cover. So I wanted to make sure that it was said. Well, no, thank you very much. I mean, uh, what's, what's quite clear from this discussion is that the areas of frictions um, and, you know, the potential for disappointment and, uh, and uh, you know, more missed receptions is, is, uh, are quite big. Uh, and, you know, this is not uh, the smooth relationship that, uh, you know, perhaps at one point the Gulf states had with the U.S., the U.S., has changed pretty dramatically. The Gulf states themselves have changed dramatically and, and the global context uh, as well. Um, you know, I, I, we've run over time and at the ISS, you, know, you get punished when, when you do that. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, I, I'll send you a picture if something happens to me. I think my boss will, will be understanding on that one. Uh, but if you wanted to add uh, one last uh, line, each uh, three of you uh, on this, I mean, A, I, I, I recommend that everyone reads, uh, you know, the, the papers that uh, Daniel put out uh, in, uh, at the Century Foundation on the future of uh, Saudi uh, uh, U.S. relations. Uh, Kirsten has actually written on what a non-aggression pact uh, between Iran and the Gulf states would look like. And Becca has written a lot, uh, and a lot is forthcoming. Uh, so, you know, she's at Sina, so you can always go there. But, you know, some concluding thoughts, maybe like two lines uh, to our audience. Uh, Daniel, can you, would you go for Sure. Well, look, I think that, that you, you are going to have uh, if, if you see a change in government, you, you would expect to see uh, some changes. And I think that what can be lost in that is a sense of how much the choices and signals that Gulf states choose to send early on will shape the discussion and the debate. And there really are policy debates within the Democratic Party on these issues. Uh, and they, to the extent that, that Gulf states take steps that build confidence uh, and address longstanding issues, I think that could register in important ways uh, in shaping the, the outcome. So I guess I would just make it clear that this is not a unidirectional uh, uh, discussion. And, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to attending your next discussion uh, to hearing, hearing more because I think this is going to be a two-way transmission. As a thank you, we'll add you to our distribution list. <laughs> uh, Becca, uh, you know, some final thoughts? Sure. I'll just conclude by saying you know, I do think that a strategic rethink of U.S. posture in the Middle East is needed. I just want to caution that it's probably not going to look the way that people expect for it to, nor unfold on the timeline that people are probably thinking about. And that this rethink needs to be part of a broader global rethink that the Department of Defense and the interagency needs to do about better mapping strategic interests, priorities, and objectives to resources and capabilities, and that this that therefore will need to be properly messaged to allies and partners around the globe, but particularly in the Gulf, as the perceptions that the Gulf partners have of what US posture changes might be, are probably going to be the drivers of how they are going to respond, and often independently. So again, in order to achieve US objectives, um, and interests, making sure that not only does U.S. posture align with those, but making sure that partners are alongside so they don't act independently in ways that undermine U.S. interests and objectives. Thank you. Kirsten. I'd say just to Europe and the Gulf, um, just remember that you do have a vote. Your actions do impact what the U.S. decides in terms of force posture. Um, and that has to do both with ideas of burden sharing, um, the ability to which you can absorb partner capacity in the part of the Gulf, uh, your relationships with, with adversaries, you know, that we've named, that kind of thing really does have an impact. So be thinking about your own decisions and not just saying, oh, well, this is the U.S. and they're unpredictable. Um, I would also say that we will be looking to the Gulf, also to Europe, although um, Europe 
continues to, to try to do this with us, to be sources of plans and strategies for stabilization in countries where we've invested blood, sweat, and tears and not destabilization. I'm looking at Libya and Somalia. You know, um, we really want you to be partners, uh, and, and, but we're looking for partner-like actions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, this is uh, going to be the topic of uh, many policy papers and op-eds and other things, I suspect, in the next uh, uh, six months to a year. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, we'll even contribute ours. Um, so we will organize a, a webinar. It's already in the plans, uh, talking to Gulf Voices on, on this, but more, you know, not just the US, more uh, other uh, international powers and their engagement in the Gulf. Uh, so please keep in touch. Uh, first, I want to apologize to the many people who asked questions and I couldn't take them all. Uh, we were limited. I would also thank uh, you know, the 120 people who uh, stayed a few more minutes uh, to listen to our panelists. And uh, finally, more importantly, thank you, Kirsten, uh, Daniel, and Becca for your time today. And Aid Mubarak to those who will celebrate in a few days. Uh, have a good day, everyone.